from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Changi, San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, a wild day to end a wild week. The S&P, on the brink of a bear market, bounces back thanks to a dramatic late-session rally. Though still on its longest losing streak in more than 20 years, we'll try to make sense of the madness. Plus, panic in both public and private markets. We're going to explore how startups are getting creative as they try to stay afloat. And Bitcoin dipping below $29,000. How long does the crypto crunch keep up? And is there hope on the horizon? We'll discuss all that in a moment. But first, it looked like we'd end the day for sure in bear market territory, but a late afternoon bounce back saved the day. Is it only a matter of time, though? Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow here to walk through the movers and who is feeling the most pain. Ed, right. take it away. You get, you get to Friday afternoon and you see this on the screen, 0.01% flat on the S&P 500. And you think it's been a nothing kind of day. Not so. Volatility across equity markets. There was this late comeback on the S&P 500. We escaped that bear market territory, that bear market label. But you look at the Nasdaq 100, we're still softer by three tenths of one percent. Very tech heavy index trading at its lowest level since November of 2020. And on a weekly basis, Basis, the S&P 500 are also lower by around 3%. It's seventh consecutive weekly decline, which we'll talk about later in the show. Bitcoin's also been interesting. It kind of held its own earlier in Friday's session above $30,000 per token, but fell away, frankly, in the latter hours of Friday's trading. Now just above $29,000 per token. And this volatility in equity markets, it was much more chill in the bond markets. You look at the US 10-year yield, 2.78%. Yes, we're down five basis points, but it wasn't one of these days where we saw a big 12 or 14 basis point jump or decline. Much more uh, a calm bond market, even though we did see a move into haven assets, risk off kind of sentiment. You see the dollar getting strength as well. Ultimately, this is the story. Come with me into my Bloomberg terminal. A bear market label or a bear market territory is where we're falling 20% on an index or an asset from its most recent high. We were at that level throughout much of Friday's session, but that late comeback sees us down 18.6% from that January third high on the S&P 500. The question really is the direction of travel from this point. Do we continue to see pressure on equity markets or do we turn a corner going into the next week? We're hoping to turn a corner, M, because I'll be honest, it's been a stressful week. I'm exhausted. You're exhausted. And we could all do with some positivity. Lastly, some specific movies we want to talk about. Apple, interesting, up two tenths of 1% on Friday's session, but it's been a real drag on the index throughout the week. And Tesla, actually also, it's lost $110 billion of market cap over the last five days or so. It has been a real drag on the index. And you forget, on one hand, we're thinking about the Fed. We're thinking about inflation. We're looking for the outlook on higher rates. But we still have supply chain problems. We still have lockdowns in China. And we're really focused on the impact on US corporates that that's having. Dear, really interesting. Earnings disappoint. A big plunge on that stock, down 14%. A big drag on the S&P 500. What's the story there? Supply chain issues. And look, lastly, I'm looking at Ross Stores, down 22%. The other big story of the week, retail, the consumer, the missed estimates, the cut forecasts, the tepid outlook. The world is changing, M, and there's a lot to consider in the markets. Obviously, interesting indeed on the back of those target results, Ed. Thank you. Uh, well, we're seeing tech stocks down across the board. As Ed mentioned, I want to talk about all this and more with Robert Cantwell, portfolio manager at Upholdings, the firm behind the Compound Kings ETF, which includes a number of mega cap tech stocks. I'm also joined by Dan Eyes, managing director at Redbush Securities, who covers some of the biggest names in the eye of this storm. Robert, I want to start with you. How much farther do you think we have to go before we hit bottom here? Well, Ed, that was a pretty negative setup. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see if we can find a silver lining in all this. Um, you know, the the one thing that's been particularly unique to us about this sell-off has been how uniform it's been across so many different technology companies, from e-commerce to media to, to software. And, but that doesn't necessarily reveal what's been happening underneath the surface. So in retail and in e-commerce and in media, you've been seeing subscriptions canceled. You've been seeing spending pullback. You've been seeing margins compressed from all the supply chain issues that you've been talking about. 
But one area that stuck out to us is cloud computing. And you take a, a business like Amazon that's down 37% year to date, that is an enormous amount of wealth destruction in a single, in a single security. But because AWS has still performed so well, Amazon's price is actually down about 50 or 60% on a valuation basis. And so what we've been telling investors in an environment like this is you're being given one of these few opportunities to ditch some of these losers, ditch these companies that are burning cash with flawed business models because you're getting opportunities to buy great businesses like AWS or ServiceNow that have actually been growing in spite of what the market has been saying about their share price. So Robert, who are the losers? <laughs> well, uh, there's, you, you certainly have the, the Carvanas, I mean, the, the companies that have had these uh, extremely marketing driven uh, growth stories that are very expensive to fund. You know, you and I, we talked a lot about the, uh, the, the ride sharing companies last time we were together. Uh, Peloton obviously falls into this group, but any business where you, you see them spending more of their gross profit on marketing dollars than any other OPEX item, that's usually a red flag, and those tend to be the companies now, if you were to throw a screen up of, you know, take gross profit minus marketing, those are the businesses that right now are all struggling the most because it's only getting more and more expensive to acquire customers when you get into these demand um, evaporating climates like the one that we're in right now. Dan, you, of course, cover some of the biggest names that are in focus here, for example, Apple, which, you know, facing some, 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 some challenges that are, you know, now facing companies across the board. How do you think Apple weathers this? Do you think Apple has further to fall? And, you know, does Apple keep innovating? Is, is this a safe buy right now? I mean, look, I think it continues to be a rock of Gibraltar stock and a business model in terms of where we see iPhone demand on the other side of the storm. And I believe, as we've talked about, it's holding up much better than expect, expectations. And I think right now, there, as your other guests are talking about, everything's going to get thrown out in this risk-off environment. And that creates the opportunities to own these names. And when you look at Apple, we think the services business alone is worth over a trillion dollars. Microsoft's another example. It's all going to be indiscriminate selling. That's the opportunity, you know, in terms of how we're handholding clients. Robert, is Apple a name to you that stands out as something that will survive the storm? I mean, Apple, you know, you're not going to find a lot of people who don't think Apple is going to keep innovating. Yeah, well, like it's fine. I mean, it's it's a safe place to put money. It's probably not the place where you're going to get these, you know, devastatingly awesome investment returns for the next 10 years. I, that's what I think is, is also really exciting about a market like this, is you get to even look past the fundamentals of some of these businesses right now. And investors are, are reevaluating saying, which pieces of technology are actually going to matter the most over the next 10 years? And everything was focused around the iPhone and the App Store for the last 10 years. And those are likely to continue to remain important, uh, but they're going to look much more mature. And you see that in some of the regulatory dealings that you know we're having to shake out with um, with businesses like Apple right now. Uh, but we think you know there, there's opportunities to look you know deeper uh, down. And you know you did a, a, a great interview the other night with uh, Dave Bazuki over at Roblox. We think that platform has the potential to be one of the most important businesses. It is right now tracking to be bigger than Nintendo. How many assets are there that exist in the market that a public investor can participate in? to get to uh, live with that type of you know, household recognition. Uh, so whether it's a business like Roblox or a cloud computing platform like an AWS or uh, enablers like Datadog, uh, these are some of the enabling technologies that we think are going to matter most um, this decade. And you can check out that interview with David Bazuki, the CEO of Roblox on Studio 1.0. Dan, I want you to react to some of the things Robert just said there. Let's talk about Apple. Is Apple just the safe bet, maybe too safe in this environment? I mean, split adjusted stock 600. They said the same thing about it at 50, at 100 hours. And now look at it. Remember, it goes back to, you know, Apple continues to be so much more innovation beyond, I think, how investors appreciate it because what we see in the install base, it's a billion iPhones, 25% of them haven't upgraded in the last three and a half years. Then you look at there being Intel at their own game in terms of the chip side plus services. So look, like Robert talked about, I think in these environments, you have to look at software, cybersecurity, and the leaders who we believe are going to be in terms of on the stalwart side, and Apple's going to be one of them. And it's one the haters will continue to hate, but this is one, in my opinion, 
we will yet again see a $3 trillion markup once the indiscriminate selling stops. Okay, uh, and I can't let you go without talking about Tesla, which is, you know, now no longer the top stock in Kathy Wood's flagship fund, of course, facing some um, different forces based on what's going on with the Musk and Twitter deal. What do you think will, the story for Tesla will continue to be here, and, and, and how much will Tesla stock suffer from the uncertainty over whether or not its CEO is going to buy Twitter? Mm -hmm. Well, look, first off, in terms of China and the zero COVID situation, that's been a huge headwind. I think you know, they're a bit off soft deliveries, and that's why we cut our price target this week. When it comes to Twitter, it's become a full-on circus show that's almost turned into a twilight zone. And, you know, you look at Musk, he opened Pandora's box, and at a time that investors have needed a hand-holding, you know, it continues to be uncertainty, not just on Twitter in terms of on the Tesla stock perspective, but on a distraction situation, that's something he needs to give comfort to investors at a time where risk assets are getting thrown out the window. Robert, what's your take on this Tesla Twitter situation and, and now the fact that they are <laughs> intricately entwined? Man, do I have to have a take? Uh, well, of course, everybody uh, has to have a take. <laughs> okay. uh, look, Twitter, Twitter's a very... I, I actually think no matter what happens, whether Elon buys Twitter or not, I do believe that Twitter is going to turn out to be a better company three or four years down the road as a result of this moment of turmoil, because it is forcing the company to look inward to reevaluate its business model. They're realizing that they can get away with charging their biggest accounts uh, for you know tweeting, and they should be. Right, We're on Twitter a ton. We pay to be on Twitter, but they don't charge us anything. Uh, so there's absolutely a way to unlock you know traditional social media monetization mechanisms they haven't taken advantage of that no matter who's running the company post all this stuff that's gets sorted out um, you know we think that's now much more likely to happen um, I, we're actually we're kind of wondering hey you know Twitter board maybe you reopen the process up like why didn't you run a full process to begin with why didn't we get multiple bidders in here why did you you know do a deal with Elon all by himself you know why didn't you see if Google wanted to take a swing at it because uh, who knows? The regulators haven't been quite as aggressive as people feared that they might be. So we, we think that this saga is far from over and that there's a wide range of potential outcomes for Twitter. And um, as it pertains to Tesla, it, it, it's still a car company. Um, and so it doesn't kind of fall into our software and digital advertising universe that we follow really closely. All right. I knew you'd have a take, so I'm glad I've asked. Thank you for sharing that with us, Robert Cantwell of Upholdings. Dan Ives, always good to have you as well. We'll see what next week holds. Coming up, a warning from VCs to startups trying to survive this market meltdown. My next guest says crowdfunding could be the answer. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Belts are tightening across the board and startups are also feeling the pain with valuations being cut and layoffs underway. For more now, I'm joined by Johnny Price, the vice president of fundraising at WeFunder. So, Johnny, first of all, you know, we see what's happening in the public markets. It's a lot more difficult to understand exactly what's happening in the private markets. What are you seeing? Just how much uncertainty and, quite frankly, panic is there? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty is the right word. Um, I think we're seeing less contraction, um, especially early stage. Um, I think growth stage is contracting a little more in recent months. Early stage, I think we're seeing less to date, um, getting kind of mixed reactions from VCs and founders uh, that I'm talking to. Um, but obviously, I'm not sure if you saw that, you know, Y Combinator emailed their founders recently saying, you know, buckle up, um, you know, uh, rain in, rain in the spending, get to default alive, uh, get to profitability ASAP because it could be a rough uh, few few months and years ahead. Well, exactly. You've got Y Combinator saying that. You've got other VCs sending out their Black Swan memos. On the other hand, I, I saw this from Ali Partovi, who's an early stage investor. He tweeted, unlike VCs predicting doom, I'm bullish for early stage startup. This downturn differs from 2000 and 2008. 
If you're an early stage CEO, don't panic. Don't obsess about extending runway. Obsess about making something people want. There's a whole uh, thread below it. What's your reaction to that? Would you agree? Um, yeah, I I think you could argue that. Um, I, th I think I'm I'm a little more pessimistic. Maybe um, I think it's going to be harder and harder for for early stage founders to raise capital um, over the coming mm -hmm. six months. Why? Um, uh, because um, there's uh, less um, VCs are going to uh, just be tightening their belts. You know, we're going to see the valuations in the public market compress the growth stage, early stage. Um, I just think it's going to be harder for early stage founders to raise. I think post post 2008, uh, we saw that. I think we're going to see that again in 2022. So we fund our focuses on something called community rounds, which of course is different from venture capital funding and also typical crowdfunding, as I understand it. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we fund as a platform that lets anyone invest in startups they love. Um, so for 80 years, the securities laws of this country, uh, as you know, didn't allow ordinary Americans to invest in startups. Uh, you had to be accredited to invest in early stage companies. Um, the Jobs Act of 2012 that was rolled up with the SEC now allows everyone, uh, not just accredited investors, not just rich people, to invest in startups they love. Um, and so uh, what we're trying to do at WeFunder um, is to popularize this concept of community rounds. Um, when the Jobs Act was rolled out, uh, it was called equity crowdfunding. Um, this is how you introduce this segment. We don't love this term, crowdfunding. Uh, we're trying to rebrand it as a community round. You you owe 25 cents to the swear jar, Emily, for using the word crowdfunding earlier. <laughs> and so the idea with a community round is that startup founders can raise up to $5 million per year from their customers, from their community, um, and uh, you know, alongside uh, conventional investors, VCs, and angels. Mercury is a great example. Um, recently, they raised a 120 million Series B from Andreessen and Co2, and then opened up a $5 million allocation to let their customers invest uh, on the same terms. Um, and Imad, the CEO, with no disrespect to Mark and Ben, has called those two and a half thousand WeFunder investors uh, his favorite investors. Uh, you know, letting his customers invest, uh, he thinks is uh, a, a good thing to do. Uh, to, you know, for his revenue, um, puts a little more cash in the bank at a time when, as we've been talking about, that's probably not the worst thing in the world. And most importantly, you know, generally a good thing to do for startup founders to be delighting their customers by letting them invest in them. Right. Give us an idea how much money has actually been community raised, though. Right now, it still seems to be the exception, not the rule. Doesn't it have to scale up yep. dramatically if the next Uber or Facebook or Google is going to be community funded? Yeah, absolutely. It's still a very small percent of early stage um, capital uh, right now. So as a percentage of VC and angel dollars, uh, community rounds are very, very small. Um, you know, it's it's been growing. Uh, so the the job the the jobs that was rolled out by the SEC in 2016, in March of 2021, the SEC uh, rolled out some improvements to the regulations that increased the amount that startup founders can raise from a million to five million per year. Um, and since then, we've seen significant growth in the sector. And the sector overall grew by about four x in 2021. And I, I think the frothy early stage VC market in 2021 was actually a break on the sector. I think in 2022 will be counter cyclical. We'll see. Can have me back in a year's time and, and see if that prediction uh, has has been borne out. Um, but as early stage VC pulls back in 2022, which we expect, um, I, I think that more and more early stage founders will be looking to their customers, looking to the community, looking to WeFunders million investors um, to to you know be a buffer and enable them to raise capital where otherwise they might be struggling to. Interesting. But to, to your point. It's not a panacea, you know. This is uh, still uh, uh, this is hopefully a silver silver lining on a on a day of pretty dark clouds. Um, it's still a relatively small part of um, you know total early stage capital formation. You can only raise five million dollars per year, um, okay. but yeah, we're seeing we're seeing positive positive trends. Another string though that can be pulled for sure. Johnny Price, Vice President of WeFunder. Thank you. Coming up, we are going to Miami, going to get a check on the crypto market. That is next. This is Bloomberg.
Bitcoin dropping below $29,000. What will the weekend hold as crypto continues to trade? I'm joined now by Bloomberg Intelligence's Mike McGlone with us from our Miami Bureau. So, Mike, talk to us about the factors at play here. It seems that cryptocurrencies are so tightly correlated with what we're seeing in equities, which is the opposite of what many investors hope they would do. We're getting there, Emily. It's just going to take a little time. But right now, it's a significant fact that you pointed out is the stock market's going down, the tide is ebbing, the Fed's jawboning, it's got to reduce that ability for people to buy stuff, reduce that risk, those risk assets. And Bitcoin and Ethereum, cryptos are a prime part of that. Remember, they went up the most, so they have to come down. But the way you started this segment, I think is the most significant thing is what's going to happen this weekend. So it's 5.30 on an afternoon on the East Coast, all markets are shut. But Bitcoin is trading, and that's what the market's starting to realize. This is the world's most fluid, 24-7 global trading vehicle with price discovery and no one else's liability. And that's starting to trickle in. So what I'm sensing is bids below Bitcoin, offers above in the stock market. And a key fact this week is Bitcoin's down about 2% and Nasdaq's down about 4%. So Bitcoin's actually outperforming this week, despite the fact it has much higher volatility. Okay. Now, not all digital tokens are being viewed equally. Are there any winners here? Well, I think Bitcoin is going to be the biggest winner, along with gold and potentially long bonds. Gold was up about 2% this week, and Bitcoin is the digital version of gold. But the way I view gold now is if you're not allocating some to Bitcoin and you're a gold investor, then you're missing out. But that's the key thing to remember. But the bottom line that's really happening in this space is the proliferation of crypto dollars. Now, we heard about what happened with an algorithmic dollar, crypto dollar that broke down. People call them stable coins. But on coin market cap now, the top of among the top four cryptos, there's two crypto dollars. There's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether, and USD coin. And this is what happened during the, the bear market in 2018. The only thing that was going up was the proliferation was increasing market cap of dollars. And I think that's what we're seeing in the space is it's just a better way to transact. That's crypto dollars. All right. Well, we'll be watching to see just how wild this weekend is indeed. Bloomberg's Mike McGlone for us in Miami. I'm going to let you get started with your weekend. Thanks, Mike. And we'll have more on the sell-off, what it means for tech coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I want to get back to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow for more on the S&P 500's losing streak. Right. Again, the longest one in a couple of decades. Exactly. So it's interesting. Like at the top of the show, we were talking about how we ended flat on the S&P 500, but there was volatility. Your guests said perhaps I was being a little bit dramatic. You know, I love drama. I'm being a diva on a Friday about the markets. But over the course of a week, that's a lot of red on the screen. The S&P 500 down 3%. The declines in technology uh, heavy indexes like the NASDAQ 100, the NYSE FANG Plus Index, which is made of the mega caps and the US listed shares of China tech companies, also seeing big declines. And there's really good reporting on the Bloomberg that if you have a 401k where you think you're diversified because you're tracking the S&P 500, well, you're just as exposed. If you strip out the five biggest mega cap tech stocks, the declines this week would have been lesser. The reality is this chart. Look on the far right hand side that block of red, the seventh consecutive weekly decline for the S&P 500, driven by tech, the likes of Apple, the longest weekly losing streak since 2001. That's a lot to take on board. And we started having discussions about how analogous, how similar what we're seeing now is like what we saw in 2000, 2001 in the dot-com bubble. Now, full disclosure, I wasn't doing this in 2000, 2001. <laughs> Neither During, was I. Right. Now, I, I've read about it. I am it. a little older than you, but I wasn't well, no quite comment. doing this yet either. No, no comment. But <laughs> I've read about it. Fortunately, you have a guest who I'm sure has studied the charts and the historical data. But this is the question, right? Are we seeing what we saw at the dot-com bubble and what happens next? Right. Indeed. Ed Ludlow, thank you. Well, 
from Apple to Tesla, some of the biggest names in the S&P 500 fueling this relentless sell-off that briefly pushed the broad equities benchmark into bear market territory. For more, I want to bring in that guest, Eric Friedman, U.S. Bank Wealth Management CIO. So, Eric, is this different than the dot-com bust or not? Emily, I actually was uh, working, in fact, about a couple blocks away from where you are right now during the, the dot-com rise in San Francisco. So I, I would say that we do think it's a little bit different this time. Really, the biggest factor behind that is more of a macro step back. With the Fed funds back then at 6.5%, that was a really elevated level. Right now, we think we probably peak at like 3 and a quarter, 35 and a half for Fed funds. So I do think that in terms of the, the selling that we saw back then, it was relentless. It certainly feels relentless now, but we do think that there, again, there's there's more of a of a calming effect that should emerge, let's call it a little later this, uh, this year. So we'd expect a little more volatility, Emily, but again, we don't have the same Fed funds backdrop that we had back then. So a little more optimistic than I was then. So, you use the word relentless. I'm wondering, does that also mean you think this sell-off is unwarranted, given the fundamentals? I mean, we did see a lot of companies, especially tech companies, miss on their results. Yeah, I don't think it's unwarranted, as, as tough as it is to, to experience, Emily. I think that, that when you go from Fed funds uh, and projections that the Fed has, has put out, there were basically nothing. Uh, you've had this whole repricing that started with the two-year and the three-year Treasury, and all their asset classes have to react. So ultimately, our viewpoint is that the, the you know, overall repricing is, is probably in the sixth, seventh inning. We think there's probably a little more left to go especially if you start to see a uh, evidence of demand and destruction. We're not seeing that quite yet, but some of the retail earnings that we saw over the past couple of, uh, of weeks indicate that there is some tough sledding ahead still. So, um, again, we do think there's probably a little more downside left, but uh, not quite the snare we saw way back in 2000, 2001. Where are we on calling a bottom here? Like, how much worse does this get? Yeah, I, I think that that for us, the you know the, the downside snare is probably down under five to seven percent across broad S and P. Probably a little more than that for Nasdaq. And, and I think at that point, Emily, the Fed has a decision to make. That would be the market sending a very clear signal that this is a this is a challenging environment, and that we're starting to see some erosion of both corporate profits as well as consumer activity. So we think that that would be really a, a heads up period where if the Fed says, you know what, we see it, but we still have to contain inflation, that would be, we think, probably a trap door for a little more downside. But again, the first test, I think, in earnest will probably come down another 5 or 7% from where we are right here. Where do you see the opportunities in tech? I mean, there, there's a lot of confusion. For example, you know, Netflix having, you know, its first subscriber loss in a decade. And then uh, Disney pulls through with surprisingly optimistic subscriber numbers. Yeah, I think a couple areas that we find attractive. One would be uh, software as a service. We, we think that, that that installed base plus the ongoing maintenance revenue is attractive. Uh, that's certainly a model that you've seen adopted from a number of, of different uh, different companies. So we still think there's uh, there's opportunity there. I would say just on a broader basis, Emily, if you look at the the bias from CFOs and COOs, they recognize that we're not getting more productive as an economy. So we do think that uh, that communications infrastructure, even though it's obviously been challenging. We still think that's an area that, as we see more hybrid um, uh, workflows continue, that's a spot that uh, we think has some opportunity. We would be moving up in cap and up in quality. Again, just as more of a, of a duck and cover type of strategy in the near term. But again, we think software as a service, as well as uh, what we're seeing with respect to broad infrastructure, uh, remain attractive. And what about on the flip side? We had a guest earlier reference the losers, saying it's time to get out of the losers. Who do you think the losers are? Well, I think there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a saying that's probably appropriate right now that it's, it's too late to sell and it's too early to buy on, on some of those, uh, some of those more challenged business models. So, I, I would say that the super consumer uh, heavy businesses, those are the ones that would be, uh, would be uh, more at risk. So let's call it the, the nice to have subscription models. Those aren't areas that we think will be, uh, will be attractive. If you look particularly at what we're seeing from a macro perspective, Emily, there really is some erosion 
in, in of course, uh, spending power because of inflation. But we do think the wealth effect is relevant here. You talked about crypto earlier, talked about just portfolios in general. We start seeing home values in, in your backyard in the Bay Area, as well as other areas that, of course, have been very, very strong. That's the next leg that we think that some of those, again, uh, secondary and tertiary uh, subscription models are, are more uh, more at risk. How bullish are you on crypto? Because, you know, we were touching on this earlier. I think a lot of crypto investors have been hoping to see crypto break away or be immune to, um, you know, broader equity sell offs. But that so far hasn't really been the case. Yeah, you know, it's something that if you look at the correlations across broad crypto and if you look across the correlations of, of assets that were supposed to act differently than they did, they're really geared, they're really levered. I mean, even if you look at, at, at NASDAQ, which uh, appropriately so is thought of as a, as a really tech heavy index, the worst performing subset of, uh, of NASDAQ is actually the industrial component. So I think what that says is that sensitivity towards the consumer is becoming uh, more of a challenge. And if you also look at, at some of the issues that we're seeing right now across currency and currency risk, again, the dollar has been a, a one-way trade higher. Uh, that's another factor that, that I think the correlations between dollar correlations towards consumer, uh, those are things that, that have been the, the other way than people expected at the start of the year. All right, Eric Friedman, we will see what next week brings. Thanks for sharing your perspective here with us. U.S. Bank Wealth Management, CIO. Coming up, crypto also still falling as we were talking about. My next guest has a few thoughts on when we might see the bottom there and how low it could go. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our crypto report, and it seems that crypto winter in full swing. For more on this, I'm joined by Kavita Gupta. She is the founder and general partner at Delta Blockchain Fund. So, Kavita, I want your take. Just how long is winter going to last and how cold is it going to get? Like, how much lower is Bitcoin going to go? <laughs> Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think it's just the beginning of crypto winter, to be very honest. And uh, I am very surprised that people are expecting that it's going to continue to hover around 30K. I do expect it to go down to somewhere between 14K, 18K, maybe 22K as a stable point. But remember, this is, we have seen this in the past two times. This is nothing new, right? Every time it goes up to an all time high, there is a point when it comes down to and find a new lower point as a base point to stand around. I still feel that we are, we have already entered crypto winter. We're going to stay here for at least year to year and a half. And hmm. we should we, yeah, I, I don't believe that Bitcoin is going to go back to 45, 50 or 60K uh, for another year and a half. We will see another all-time high, but that will be uh, for Ethereum too, actually, especially for Ether, because I believe this is the time when people are going to build and they're going to have a lot of technology with major adoption. Look at what FTX just announced, which is going to bring a lot more people into the space. And that adoption is going to trigger back us to another big high cycle. So let's just game this out for, for, for a moment. You think Bitcoin, for example, will stay in the $20,000 range for the next year, year and a half, potentially? I, yeah, we can see some more dips and we can see some more high, but I don't think that we're going to see it going back to 60 to 70K during the winter time, anytime soon. Huh. So then what does the new high become after that? I mean, a lot of investors are getting in just waiting for that. <laughs> I think a lot of people have been talking about Bitcoin at 100K, and I, uh, I, I, I can't really predict whether it would be 100K or not, but I can definitely say it's going to find a new high, which was last time 64,000 something. Uh, but as I said, every time if you look at the history and look at the data, every time if it has gone back, it's not purely speculative anymore. As, 
uh, speculation is definitely a part of it, but it's also the adoption of technology. It's also the adoption by big companies and institutions. Tesla holding it on their balance sheet makes it goes up. Twitter having uh, uh, basically tipping mechanism on Bitcoin makes it go up. And I feel like the same thing with Ethereum and other technology driven tokens that we're gonna see the adoption making it go all time high but I don't think it's going to happen in another year to year and a half. I'm curious what you think about what's happening at Coinbase and, you know, the most established platform for the trading of cryptocurrency, you know, and obviously their business is, you know, somewhat divorced from, you know, the actual trading of, of mm -hmm. cryptocurrency. What do you make of, what do you think the fate of Coinbase is? I, I mean, Coinbase is a centralized exchange. I don't see all this speculation about Coinbase going uh, bankrupt. Honestly, I don't believe that because the technology is so strong. And I do understand that when the when it is really deep, you don't see that much of trading volume and exchange making money out of the trading volume uh, or the DeFi and staking, et cetera, will not have that much of cash to show. So their 430 million losses, I completely understand when a company is into an expansion mode and suddenly crypto price is dumb, this is what you expect. Uh, but will that make them disappear? I don't think so. Uh, I do believe that they have already announced that they're going to have a hiring freeze, they're going to take care of cost, etc. And I do see them weather the storm, honestly speaking, uh, but with different measures intact there. We keep hearing it is time to build, and I'd love to get a little more specific. When it comes to crypto projects, what do you think makes it and why what gets washed out? Uh, I think a lot of fluff gets washed out. Um, as a as a pre-seed, seed stage, early tech investor for over five, six years now in the space, I can tell you every time there is a high, anyone who thinks, oh, I have an idea, their idea thinks is like $100 million valuation. Now you're coming back to 15 to 20, 25 million dollar valuation with the product or the MVP associated with it. Last time we saw DeFi really, really getting built during the crypto winter. And that's pushing the adoption and the money coming into the space, which also had NFT associated with that. Before that, in 2016 and 17, the ICO, the smart contract on Ethereum, is what made us come down, come up from the crypto winter and hype of $1,700, $1,800 for ETH. And I think as we go into the space, I think multi-chain indexing, search results, a lot of analytics platform, uh, we see that's gonna really gonna build out and maybe a whole new uh, whole new infrastructure platform. I mean, people have been buying NFTs for multi-million dollars. We really don't have a proper infrastructure for NFTs right now. And I'm very excited about what's going to come out of this crypto winter. Curious about your thoughts on Elon Musk potentially taking over Twitter, you know, given its role in the crypto community and Elon Musk's role in the crypto community himself. Do you think decentralized social media is actually possible with blockchain technology? As of the current technology, which I have seen in the space, I don't think so. Identity has been a huge problem in the space. We still need to figure out a lot of indexing, identity, trust associated. But should social media and reputation system is a huge problem, which we still figuring it out. Um, but in the future, can there be a technology where it could be truly decentralized? Absolutely, that would be an ideal day. But no, it cannot be possible. It, it's not possible with any technology I've seen in the space so far. So are you calling Elon Musk's bluff then? I, I think he's a visionary. He probably thinks that over years he's going to build. It's like when 10 years back he went and said he's going to put people on Mars. Uh, I mean, he has put a spacecraft on there. Uh, there hasn't been a human being out there, but hopefully next 10 to 15 years there would be. And I think that's what he's looking for, a decentralized social media, which is a novel idea and something which would be great for the tech and people and mental health, I guess. Uh, but is it possible today in an year, two year, three year? I don't think so. Hmm. All right. So looking forward, you know, the market is still reeling from the Terra debacle. What's next? What's next for stable coins? I think uh, we have to make a differentiation like Terra was is a programmatic stable coin, right? When the definition of stable coin came, it is like pegged to some fiat currency and one is to one. So USDC had to show in their audits like how much 
reserves do they really have in dollars, cash, cash equivalent, bonds, treasuries, et cetera, et cetera, to support it, and so did USDT to a particular percentage. I think Terra is different. It has been on the programmatic side. So one thing which we have learned, though the decentralized world will always push away from fiat and try to have different version of programmatic stable coin, which is pegged by its own cryptocurrency. We do have a lot of issues and a lot of gaps as of now, which Terra just showed. Um, will there ever be a programmatic stable coin? I absolutely 100% believe so. Uh, hmm. Would uh, would that be in an year or two during this uh, crypto winters? I don't think so, because a lot of trust has been shaken and a lot of people got wiped out. Wow. All right, Kavita Gupta, Delta Blockchain Fund founder. Thanks for giving it to us straight. Uh, appreciate it. More still to come. This is Bloomberg. get back to the markets and bring back our Ed Ludlow one final time. So the big question is, does this volatility continue next week or not? There was an investor earlier in the show who thought you were being a little dramatic. Yeah, they thought I was being dramatic. I mean, if we knew the answer to which way markets would go, we'd all be very rich, right? If you're an investment manager or retail investor, all we can do as financial journalists is look at the past data. And what's really interesting, if you think about the S&P 500, we almost fell into a bear market. That's a 20% decline from the most recent high. We've seen this before on an intraday basis. I'm going to give you a history lesson. Oh, thank I'm you. I'm sorry for a Friday. <laughs> 1998, 2011, 2018. The market on an intraday basis, some cases went beyond 20% as a decline. But it never actually closed in a bear market. Mm. And we never even got close to those levels in the weeks that followed. So it's a psychological test for the market. And really, a, a conversation is, what is it that we're worried about? What is, is it inflation? Is it the Fed? Where do we look for some hope? Well, and it's interesting hearing our guests speak throughout the show that the fundamentals, the macroeconomic yeah. issues are very different right now yeah. than what we saw in 2001, yeah. for example. And we should bring it back to tech. Mm -hmm. I mean, remember some of these companies like Apple that are now feeling a lot of pain. These are like amazing companies, strong balance sheets, you know, but there's so much happening at once. When we talk about tech broadly, we have to remember what the story is here. The Fed is going to raise rates and higher rates discount the present value of future profits, making tech stocks less attractive as an option. But at the same time, we're worried about whether the Fed can fight inflation without causing recession. In other words, if they raise rates too quickly and in too big increments, the, mar the economy might crash. And no one does well in a bad economy like that, not even the likes of Apple. But if you look at the companies and their fundamentals, and if you, if you talk about yeah. a company like Apple, which was on the brink of bankruptcy, literally, in the late 90s, it's right. a completely different story today. Right. Right. Apple's going to keep making new products they that people cash. want right. to buy. Right. And they've got a lot of cash, they have innovation, they have scale, and then we, we wonder what's going on in the rest of the world. We right. put aside the Fed, we put aside the inflation picture, and we worry about supply chains, the lockdowns in China. Then a, a big problem has been, we're really sorry guys, we missed earnings because we couldn't sell enough products. Right. Why? Because our supply chains are in tatters. And the question is how are investors going to interpret it? And there is also this Tesla, Twitter, Elon Musk overhang, which is because of a completely different narrative. Yes, Tesla has supply chain issues. Right. But is Elon Musk going to buy Twitter? Is he going to? You know, is, I, is, is, it gonna, is he going to take Tesla down with it or what? I thought I was going to get through an entire show without talking about Elon Musk. I, I really know, thought how, would this would be the day. But there's two things: key man risk. Elon Musk is very busy. He's the CEO of Tesla, and the market's asking, is he distracted? That's mm -hmm. the simple t way of looking at it. But also with Twitter, you know, all of this indecision about will the deal happen, won't it happen, Twitter didn't really suffer like the rest of tech stocks. It hasn't seen the declines that other tech companies have. And there's a question, why? Well, because it was subject to a takeover deal, a take private deal. But if you factor in the sell-off we've seen in tech, should Twitter be revalued and should Elon Musk come back in at a lower price, 
I don't know. Who knows? Twitter's annual meeting next week. You're going to be there. It's going to ah, be a big moment. We're going to be talking about this a lot. So don't forget it yet. At Ludlow, thank you. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Wall Street Week with my colleague David Weston. Coming up next, he's going to be talking about inflation and all of this in just a moment. Monday, Shantanu Narayan of Adobe.